Welcome to EPG Patshala. This is the Philosophy of Law paper, module Queering Law. The objective of this module is to introduce students to the idea of queering law within the Indian constitution, constitutional history, and case law. This module was written by Arvind Narayan of the Alternative Law Forum. I'm Akash Singh Rathor from Lewis University in Rome. What can this mean? What do we mean by queering law? It means to bring in a perspective on law that allows silenced voices to speak, to reread law and legal history from a queer and subaltern point of view. A queer perspective on law can inform us about political engagement, about the processes of legal change, and also give us a way to reread legal history. The fact is that the historical existence of queer people has been rendered invisible through silence. It's also been rendered immoral by a dismissal of what is actually a very robust same-sex tradition in Indian history. This has been rendered completely irrelevant. And by a willful attempt to heterosexualize existing queer traditions, we have managed to silence uh, the existence of queer culture in India. What this does is it introduces heteronormativity. Heteronormativity means that heterosexual sex and love are the norm and are to be normatively imposed on everybody universally. But has the Indian tradition always been heteronormative? While homosexuality was subject to certain strictures in pre-colonial texts, such as the Manusriti, it's actually unclear to us whether it was homosexuality as such that was sought to be punished, or whether it was sexual transgression more generally, or quite specifically, violation of caste norms. Queer historians such as Ruth Vanita and Salim Kidwe have uncovered innumerable stories of same-sex love in Indian history against the dominant trend of Indian historiography. That trend has always been heteronormative. In their fascinating book, Same Sex Love in India, these authors look at Indian mythology, Indian literature, and broader Indian history to question the silence and misinformation on the queer aspect of India's past. This book attempts to portray a wide array of Indian texts, passages from literature, poems, mythology, where the closest relationships are those between men and men or women and women. In other words, what we come to realize is that within India's past and rich and diverse history, heteronormativity has been only one amongst rival traditions of the way that we view sexuality. So it turns out that the clearest strictures against homosexuality do not come necessarily from within the Indian tradition, but rather in the process of colonizing India and imposing colonial law. This takes its first substantive expression in Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. It was through Section 377 that for the first time in India, homosexuality was criminalized and explicitly labeled as unnatural sex with a serious punishment leading up to several years, perhaps even life imprisonment. This section was drafted by the now infamous Lord Macaulay in 1837 and came into force in 1860. Let me read to you Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. Section 377, Unnatural Offenses. Whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman, or animal shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall be liable to a fine. So what's important about this is that we have the words voluntary, carnal intercourse, order of nature, and any man, woman, or animal. What does this mean? It means that this law conflates both coercive and consensual sex. As we know, there's a big difference between coerced sex, rape, consensual sex. And consequently, 
This creates enormous problems for understanding clearly what it is that's prohibited by this uh, section. It turns out that what we find is what's prohibited is not so much activities, but that it targets specific persons. Which persons? This becomes much clearer in a later act called the Criminal Tribes Act of 1871. This act was specifically targeting hijras. For some reason, the act has remained relatively unnoticed, but it provides for us a clear indication of the kind of uh, people and actions that were being targeted through the colonial uh, uh, norms written down in the uh, IPC. The link is to be found in an amendment written in 1897 to the Criminal Tribes Act of 1871, which was titled An Act for the Registration of Criminal Tribes and Eunuchs. What this did was it created the link between sexual nonconformity, in other words, sex outside of heteronormativity, and criminality. Under the provisions of this strange statute, a eunuch was deemed to include all members of the male sex who themselves admit or uh, about whom it's discovered on medical inspection that they are impotent. That generally meant that they were castrated. The local government was required to register the name and residence of all eunuchs who were reasonably suspected of kidnapping or castrating children or of committing offenses under Section 377, which we've already read out of the Indian Penal Code. Now, a reasonable uh, suspicion is one thing, but when we find out that what makes a particular person suspicious is that he might dress as a woman in public or that he might dance or play music in a public exhibition, we realize that this is an uh, uh, extremely unjust uh, provision specifically targeting hijras who could be arrested without warrant simply for dancing in public. The invidious role played by the Criminal Tribes Act was actually recognized in a judgment by the Delhi High Court, which we are going to call the Nas decision, where the judges of the court noticed that while this act, that means the Criminal Tribes Act, has been repealed, the attachment of the association of criminality to the Hijra community continues up to this day. So you can see that the introduction of acts like this not only serve criminalize certain behavior at the level of law, but they actually contribute to a stigmatization of people at the social level. So we come now to the current era um, and the understanding of how this queer legal consciousness has arisen. Well, obviously, the political consciousness of queers in India emerged with the very passing of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, which conceptualized being queer as unnatural. The public emergence of a queer political consciousness, however, emerged much, much later, about 150 years later, through publications written by activists, such as the Less Than Gay Report of 1991, the Campaign for Lesbian Rights, which is popularly known as the Kaleri Report in 1997, and what I think is most significant, the PUCL Karnataka reports on the human rights violations against sexual minorities, published in 2001, and in 2003, another human rights report by the same institution about violence against the transgender community. So what we find in these reports between 1991 and 2003 is that the uh, violent treatment meted out to the LGBT community gays, hijras, lesbians, um, that this finally gets taken up as a question of a violation of fundamental human rights. When you criminalize the lifestyle of the LGBT community, you simultaneously open them up to the possibility of violence, to the possibility of blackmail. There have been numerous instances uh, reported where a 
member of the LGBT community attempts to report a crime committed against uh, the person who ends up being uh, victimized, brutalized, raped by the police that he or she is trying to report the crime to. Now, what can legitimize that sort of ill treatment to a person who's attempting to report a crime? precisely because the lifestyle of that person is itself criminalized. Coming back to the emergence of queer legal consciousness, in 2006, the poet and novelist Vikram Seth, uh, along with the Nobel Prize winning economist and philosopher Amartya Sen, argued that decriminalizing an expression of romantic love made the tide turn. This letter built on a decade of work by LGBT activists in the form of fact-finding reports like the ones that I had mentioned, the less than gay report and so on, by activist interventions, conferences, writing in the media on the pernicious effects of the law. Now we move on to the uh, Nas Foundation case, which was a case uh, brought to the Delhi High Court in 2001 by the Lawyers Collective HIV AIDS Unit on behalf of the Nas Foundation, which is an NGO in Delhi. The Lawyers Collective filed a constitutional challenge to Section 377 of the IPC, stating that this uh, law was in violation of certain fundamental rights protected in the Indian Constitution, namely equality, privacy and freedom of expression. So the argument by the, the lawyers on behalf of the Nas Foundation is that we have a law passed by uh, Act of Parliament, but this uh, uh, act that Parliament has passed is what's called ultra vires, is beyond the uh, validity of the Parliament to enact because what it states violates certain fundamental rights protected under the basic law of the land. The basic law of the land being the Constitution of India, not any act of Parliament. So the lawyers contended that the Delhi High Court, whose job it is, is to adjudicate whether an act of Parliament is constitutional or not. The lawyers suggested that the Delhi High Court should uh, declare this law unconstitutional so that it is repealed and removed from the IPC. Well, let's talk about the changes in social awareness that allowed a case like this to come before the Delhi High Court. In the first case, homosexuality and homosexuals themselves were far more visible in 2009, by the time this uh, appears in public consciousness, than uh, ever before in uh, recent Indian past. There were more queer people spanning multiple professions that had come out as being gay or bisexual or transgender or lesbian than any time in the recent past. The most fitting illustration of the role that coming out can play in changing not only social attitudes but even the attitudes uh, of the judiciary is uh, apparent to us in the example of the United States Supreme Court who in 1986 actually upheld certain anti-sodomy laws. But later in 2003, in a groundbreaking decision called Lawrence v. Texas, the same US court voted to strike down the same anti-sodomy laws. It was explained that in 1986, not a single member of the US Supreme Court knew anyone personally who was gay. And yet in 2003, Every single member of the United States Supreme Court knew somebody who was openly gay or lesbian or bisexual. So the fact that gays and the L members of the LGBT community have come out on the street and that we realize uh, that these are respectable people living so-called normal lives can really change our perception over the nature of their uh, behavior and the rights that uh, they should enjoy as being simply one of us.
Similarly, in India, by 2009, due to the nature of media publicity and the interaction with gay and lesbian judges from other Indian jurisdictions, it was likely that members of the, ju the judiciary of the Delhi High Court also knew people who were gay. The Nas Foundation decision comes at a time when mainstream culture was increasingly being queered. That is, literature, plays, movies, dance performances, and many other forms of entertainment increasingly had queer themes and openly queer characters. Even Bollywood cinema uh, started to represent queerness in mass culture. In 2008, the hit film Dostana used the word gay openly and casually for more or less the first time in Bollywood cinema. Dostana thus introduced queerness to the Indian public and initiated conversations about sexuality, not only in uh, uh, homes, but even in public places. So combined with this change in public culture was a growing sense of entitlement in the queer community. While in 1996, there was a palpable sense of fear amongst members of the LGBT community. Could they come out in public? Would they be ostracized, stigmatized? Would they be subject to violence, uh, rape, abuse? In 2008, that community felt more secure, more visible, and became much more vocal. So let's get to the le legal theoretical innovations of the Nas decision. As a philosopher of law, this decision represents a, a, an enormous set of innovations in India's legal and constitutional history. The judgment inaugurated a new discourse on queer people, moving away from the terms such as carnal intercourse that appear in the IPC statute and inhabiting the new language of dignity, privacy, equality, and inclusiveness. So in other words, we're desexualizing the uh, lifestyle of the LGBT community and we're politicizing it in terms of rights and uh, dignity and privacy, terms that we share universally amongst uh, humankind. So the judges of the Delhi High Court overturned a 150-year-old discourse which saw homosexuality merely within the frame of unnatural sexual intercourse. This is a very uh, major uh, event. The court held that criminalization of consensual sex between adults, remember that the law had conflated consensual and coercive sex, so the court held that criminalization of consensual sex between adults in private certainly violates the Constitution's guarantee of dignity, of equality, and of freedom from discrimination based on sexual orientation. In other words, Articles 21, 14, and 15. But let's be clear here. The article on discrimination does not state that discrimination based on sexual orientation is not forbidden. The article actually states discrimination based on sex. Now, sex has always been understood to be gender. You cannot discriminate based on the gender of a person. And yet the Delhi High Court now says that it, this is the prohibition of discrimination based on sexual orientation. I'll discuss this uh, more a bit further. The main headings under which we can discuss the innovations of the Nas decision are these concepts, dignity, privacy, equality, life, that's right to life, constitutional morality, which is very interesting because in the case law of the Indian Supreme Court, this idea of constitutional morality, which is Dr. Ambedkar's idea, which he espoused while uh, launching the constitution, has never really been taken up within the discourse of the judgments of the Indian Supreme Court. But now the Nas Foundation decision introduces constitutional morality and an idea which I'm going to refer to as majority tyranny. What that basically means is that the rights of a majority to legislate their morality and enforce their morality on the practices of a minority. This is commonly called the problem of majority tyranny.
So let's begin with dignity. The Nas Foundation decision adopts a view of human dignity that privileges the ability to freely make choices about how to live one's life. Now, this is guaranteed in some respects in Article 21 of the Constitution, but if this decision on how to live one's life, that I should choose to live amongst the LGBT community, is criminalized, then the question, of course, remains whether Article 21 protects that lifestyle choice or not. The court suggested that the idea of dignity demands that the person is free to make lifestyle choices provided they do not uh, violate the reasonable limitations put on those lifestyle, lifestyle choices. Generally, we know those to be harm, uh, decency, obscenity, safety, and so on. From this notion of dignity, the Delhi High Court derives a concept of privacy that is completely radical. In other words, privacy, according to this decision, deals with persons and not places. Now, throughout the history of philosophy, moral philosophy, political philosophy, and legal philosophy, the understanding of privacy has been most foundationally locational. In other words, there is a public space and there is a private space. The government's job is to regulate in the public while they should not enter the household. They should not enter the bedroom. Government's job is to legislate in the public sphere, leaving the domain of the private up to individual decision, provided that no criminality is involved and whatever other reasonable limitations there are on what we practice in private. But you see, this is locational. What the Nas Foundation decision did, I think one of the most interesting things that, that it did, the most revolutionary, was to envision the right to privacy guaranteed in the Indian Constitution, not as merely having to do with private spaces, but also the privacy of my internal consciousness to make my own choices. In other words, to make choices about how to live my life. That means that privacy is fundamentally tied up not merely with uh, uh, dichotomy from the public sphere, but with personal autonomy. In other words, it's not merely zonal or locational, it becomes decisional. And as far as I know, this is a total innovation in legal thought. Another innovation in legal thought undertaken by the Delhi High Court was the way they conceived equality. In furtherance of the equality argument, the court found that, and I quote, sexual orientation is a ground analogous to sex and that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is not permitted by Article 15 of the Indian Constitution. Now, I had already mentioned that what Article 15 of the Indian Constitution states is that it is prohibited to discriminate on the basis of sex. Now, what we've always understood that to mean is whether you are a male or a female or now in contemporary constitutional dispensation, a member of the third gender. However, the Delhi High Court states that sexual orientation is analogous to sex. In other words, sex no longer becomes grounded in biology and uh, uh, gender. It is analogized to practices and orientations. So this is the second time that the Delhi High Court radically revolutionizes the way that we normally think about uh, 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 certain terms within constitutional history. Privacy has always been locational and they make it decisional as well. Sex has always been biological gender grounded and the court makes it an orientation as well. This means that the justices construe the meaning of sex in Article 15 as not merely physical but also preventing discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. That it 
highly dilates the idea of equality. So we've seen that the idea of privacy has been dilated or expanded. We see that the idea of equality, another fundamental constitutional right, has been expanded. And there is another interesting expansion that the Delhi High Court undertakes, which is in its reading of Article 21 of the Constitution. Now, we know that this article has been interpreted in the past as a right to access to health. So the right to life that is, um, uh, and personal liberty that is guaranteed under Article 21 has already in previous cases of the Supreme Court been expanded to cover right to access to health. Well, now the Delhi High Court uh, relies on that already expanded definition to say that the LGBT community has been victimized in such a way that its access to proper health treatment, especially in relation to HIV and AIDS prevention, violates its fundamental right to health, which is guaranteed in Indian case law by Article 21's guarantee of the right to life. So you can see yet another extension of a basic fundamental right from the right personal liberty and life under Article 21 to the right to health under Indian case law to the right of the LGBT to access proper health care without fear of criminalization to allow them to get treatment for HIV AIDS uh, in India. Obviously, if you're engaged in a criminal activity, going to the hospital to seek treatment for what is believed to be the consequences of that criminal activity do not permit you to get uh, uh, adequate health care. And the court uh, found that in violation of Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. And one more innovation that the Delhi High Court uh, introduced through this absolutely amazing decision of the Nas Foundation is on the subject of constitutional morality. The Delhi High Court held that the public's opinion on morality, so whether it be prudish or liberal, cannot be used as a justification for limiting the fundamental rights of a minority, in this case the LGBT minority. This they held went against what Dr. Ambedkar called constitutional morality. So constitutional morality, the Delhi High Court claimed, was at the heart of the Indian Constitution and was the way that we should always interpret the Indian Constitution. Just like we interpret it along the lines of the directive principles, we should also interpret its morality along the lines of what's called constitutional morality. Now, this concept was introduced by Dr. Ambedkar in the Constituent Assembly. He stated this, I quote, Constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. We must realize that our people have yet to learn it. Democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil which is essentially undemocratic. So Dr. Ambedkar's position here was that while we're introducing a very progressive constitution that guarantees full rights to all minorities, and in this case, Dr. Ambedkar specifically referencing the Dalits subalterns, the constitutional morality has to be inculcated. So the constitution was probably morally more progressive than Indian mainstream society. So what's the attitude that we need to take? Do we need to read the constitution in line with a regressive Indian moral society? Or do we need to read and judge the opinions of the majoritarian moral uh, society in accord with the more progressive constitutional morality? Obviously, Dr. Ambedkar thought that we needed to uplift the masses, support the minorities, and therefore free minorities from the majoritarian instincts of the um, uh, moral and uh, social, uh, let's say, uh, 
um, illiberalism of the masses uh, around the 1940s. So the judges in the Nas Foundation decision take this episode of Dr. Ambedkar in the Constituent Assembly and they say that we have to adopt a constitutional morality in this case. We cannot criminalize homosexuals only on account of their sexual, sexual orientation. This would be to succumb to the tyranny of the majority and the imposition of heteronormativity of the majority onto a minority and therefore violate their fundamental rights. So we move now from the Nas Foundation decision to the appeal that was made to the Indian Supreme Court and the future of queer legal consciousness in the wake of the decision of the Indian Supreme Court. On 11 December 2013, Justice Singhvi's decision in the case called Kushal v. Nas Foundation upheld the validity of Section 377. By doing so, it effectively recriminalized the lives of the LGBT Indian citizens. This, as we call it, Kushal judgment, failed to demonstrate why it reached the conclusion that Section 377 was constitutionally valid. This is quite a problem. The Supreme Court did not address any of the inf innovations that we have gone through. For example, the innovation about dignity and privacy, the innovation about equality, about the right to life, the innovation about discrimination based on sexual orientation and not just gender. Instead of going through the arguments and explaining why it didn't accept these, it simply suggested that since 377 of the IPC does not in itself condone the mistreatment or violence that the sexual minority suffer as a consequence of its propagation, it is not in violation of the Constitution. Well, this decision then obviously goes back to a positivist or an Austinian understanding of legal theory. That is one that understands the positive law as supreme over the, let's say, ideas of dignity or natural rights that might be understood to underlie them. Instead, it favored majority will, that is the act of the parliament, over minority rights, that is the job of a constitutional court to protect. To sum up, in the Delhi High Court's ju judges fitting conclusion, I quote, if there is one constitutional tenet that can be said to be underlying the theme of the Indian Constitution, it is that of inclusiveness. The Delhi High Court was referring to Prime Minister Nehru's tryst with destiny speech in that moment and stating that not only does our Constitution have the Gandhian motivation of wiping a tear from every eye, the Ambedkarite motivation of constitutional morality and liberation of minorities, but also the Nehruvian motivation of inclusiveness. The Delhi High Court points these out also through acknowledgement of the theme of constitutional morality as being violated by discrimination against the LGBT persons. However, the victory of the Nas Foundation decision has seen a great setback with the Indian Supreme Court's Kushal decision, which some have argued seems to go against the Gandhian, Ambedkarite, and Nehruvian motivations behind the Constitution, which attempt to encourage all rights of minorities provided that they do not violate uh, the um, integrity or decency of the uh, majority's uh, own style of life. Thank you.